You are welcome to this brief introduction to the New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verses 51 through 60, as we resume our study of Stephen's discourse before the Jerusalem Sanhedrin. Let's get into it. By way of background, Stephen, when accused by false witnesses before the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, or Council, of speaking against the Temple and against the Mosaic Law, replies by recounting accurately highlights of Israelite history. In his discourse, Stephen presents a thesis. Despite the many ways in which Yahweh, the God of Israel, had blessed the Israelites, they often rebelled against him, disobeying his laws and instructions, worshiping other gods. Stephen cites five instances. First, the Israelites rejected Moses when he first offered to deliver them from Egyptian oppression. Secondly, some forty years later, when Moses was leading the Israelites towards a promised land, they were unwilling to be obedient to him. On the contrary, they rejected him and turned back to Egypt in their hearts. Thirdly, they went so far as to make idols for themselves while Moses was away receiving the law from the Lord at Mount Horeb. Fourthly, the prophet Amos accused the Israelite northern tribes of worshipping Babylonian and Syrian minor gods related to the planet Saturn. More about that in a moment. And fifthly, Israelites persecuted and murdered many of their own prophets sent to them from God. In Acts 7.43, Stephen will cite a verse from the prophet Amos 5.26. The Amos verse reads, You shall take up Sikut your king, and Kayun your star god, your images that you made for yourselves. A direct quotation of the Hebrew text. The Greek Septuagint, however, translates this verse a bit differently as we shall see below. So in 743, Stephen cites Amos from the Greek Septuagint when he says, You took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship. The Greek New Testament cites the Greek Septuagint almost word for word. How can we explain the differences between the Hebrew text and the Greek Old and New Testament text? Well, when the Septuagint was translated, most Hebrew texts had only consonants. That is, they did not write vowels with their consonants. Thus, the word MLK, Malik, can mean either a king or a god named king, including the god Moloch. The consonants of the word spelled S-K-K-T-H can be translated Sukkot or tents, or it can be translated as Saturn, adopted from the Assyrian language, and then the word K-Y-N-N, also a name for Saturn in the Syrian language, Kewan, and in Arabic, Kaiwan. The Dictionary of Demons and Deities notes that the Masoretic or Hebrew vocalization of both names is that for idols. And in Mesopotamia, Saturn is the only star not related to one of the major deities. Thus, Stephen is accusing the Israelites not only of worshipping false gods, but of worshipping a minor god of little importance. 
In his discourse, Stefan presents a counter-accusation. Acts 7.51 reads, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your heart, and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit, you are doing just as your fathers did. A few notes about this text. Stiff-necked means obstinate as in Exodus 33.3. By calling them uncircumcised in their heart, they are making out these national leaders to be very similar to Gentiles. In a few moments, they will cover their ears as they seize Stephen and drag him out of the city to kill him. The same accusation is made in Jeremiah 6.10. By referring to the Holy Spirit, Stephen was alluding to Isaiah chapter 63, in which the Holy Spirit is himself Yahweh, also called the angel of his presence, an everlasting name, and the Spirit of Yahweh, the God of Israel. If you teach this passage to discussion groups, you might ask these two queries. Why did Stephen mention the Holy Spirit? Remember both Isaiah and the promises made by Jesus and by John the Baptist. And then, how does this help to explain the unforgivable sin, a sin against the Holy Spirit? Continuing on, Stephen asks, Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the Righteous One, and you have now become betrayers and murderers of him, you who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. The term the Righteous One seems to be taken from Isaiah chapter 53, wherein the Righteous One is equivalent to the servant of the Lord, the one who would suffer for the sins of the people and then be honored by God. Now, why did Stephen ask a rhetorical question? Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Why did he not simply make a declarative statement? Your fathers persecuted the prophets. Thirdly, we note that the term ordained by angels means ordered or commanded, but ordained by angels? Was the law not given by the Lord himself? Compare Galatians 3.19, where we're told that the law was given through angels. And then discuss which point of the law had they not kept. See verse 27. And betrayed by whom? And who killed the righteous one? Was it the Romans? Was it the Judeans? Or, colluding together, did they both? From verse 54, we read about the illegal execution of Stephen. Now, when they heard this, they were infuriated, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The gnashing of teeth seems to be a cultural signal indicating furious anger. To be full of the Spirit means to be marked by the Spirit or, more commonly, motivated by the Spirit. Seeing heaven opened recalls the teaching in Hebrews chapter 10 about the way being made open into the heavenly places for us who belong to Jesus. The phrase, the Son of Man, defined here as Jesus, recalls the text in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, 
cited also by Jesus. And then Psalm 110 verse 1 is where David said that my Lord would one day sit beside God, a text also cited by Jesus. The phrase, the Son of Man, then, refers to a heavenly being resembling a human being. Remember, Daniel had said, Behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming, and to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom. This is why Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man. Your right hand, Lord, is majestic, majestic in power, Moses had said in Exodus chapter 15. Jesus said to the Judean leaders, From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. In Mark chapter 14, the words of Jesus are quoted a little differently. You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. It was a common teaching in the intertestamental period that Yahweh himself often appeared as two powers in heaven, one the invisible God, and secondly, God appearing in visible form. In verse 55, we read that Stephen saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then in the following verse, he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Thus, Jesus is identified again as the Son of Man. In Mark chapter 14, the high priest was questioning Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replied, I am, employing the very words which are the meaning of the divine name, Yahweh. Now in the Old Testament, as we look for God called the Blessed One, we discover that the prophets had said that King Solomon will be blessed and the throne of David will be established before the Lord forever. Thus we're left with the question, the Son of the Blessed One, does that mean the Son of God? Or does this mean Son of Solomon, the Christ? By referring to power, we recall the scripture, 1 Chronicles 29, Lord, you rule over all, and in your hand is power, dynamis, and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. In the words of Jesus, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, dynamis, and coming with the clouds of heaven. In your discussion groups, you might pose this query. Who can be full of the Holy Spirit? Until this point in the book of Acts, only the apostles were full of the Spirit, that is, motivated by the Holy Spirit. But now, a layman appointed a deacon by the apostles himself is full of the Holy Spirit. And what does it mean to be full? Well, picture the wind blowing and filling the sail of a boat, thus motivating, pushing the boat forward, an external power. Thirdly, who else in Stephen's defense saw the glory of God? And what will we see at the moment of death? Many have pointed out that Stephen saw Jesus standing, was Jesus welcoming Stephen, interceding on his behalf, or was he standing in judgment against the mob? See Isaiah 3.13. But they shouted with loud voices and covered their ears and rushed at him 
with one mind. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid their own cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. One mind was used of the apostles and of the early believers previously in this book. When it says that the witnesses stopped their ears, this recalls Deuteronomy chapter 17, as well as John chapter 8, in which it was witnesses who were required to cast the first stones in the event of capital punishment. In your discussion groups, you might ask, whom else had they killed outside the city? What law was the mob keeping? And what law was the mob breaking? Oh, and who was the young man named Saul? They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. When Stephen prayed, Receive my spirit, he actually employed an imperative, a command form. And as far as we know, this is the first time in the New Testament period that anyone used for Jesus the title Lord Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, 34, Jesus is also reported to have said, Forgive them. However, this phrase is not found in, in the oldest and best Greek manuscripts. It is a variant manuscript reading found in Papyrus P75 from the 3rd century and in Codex Vaticanus from the 5th century. The question remains, did early scribes want to make Jesus to be as spiritual as Stephen? Or did Stephen learn this prayer from Jesus' example? And if Jesus had really said so, why were his words struck from the Greek manuscripts? In your study groups, discuss, when is it all right to command God to do something? Think about what he has promised to do. What is it that falls asleep at the moment of death? Is it the soul? Is it the body? Is it both? Did God ever answer Stephen's prayer that God forgive his murderers? Well, think about the young man Saul. Who did he become? And then, what sin is so horrible that God will not forgive it? By way of a general application of this passage, discuss together what lessons can we take from this account? Perhaps also, when is it not enough to behave as a nice little Christian, never offending anyone? Jesus had promised his followers that whenever they were arrested and taken before the authorities, the Holy Spirit would give to them in that same hour the words that they were to speak. So when we are dragged before hostile authorities who demand that we explain our actions, we will speak the truth firmly, ready to take the consequences of our words.